was born in Malaysia yep. in 1961 and uh, mom and dad gave birth to eight children and I'm the oldest among the eight. So I got three younger brother, four younger sister. Uh, my childhood was not as good as uh, normal Australian here. Uh, we, we don't have a, uh, a lot of money, so we live, we live quite poor. Uh, our house is like uh, uh, the roof when it rained, water was seep through, and then our floor is like uh, earth. We don't have a concrete floor or carpet, it's just earth. So when it rains, it touches the earth, the earth becomes very slippery. So this strike in my mind very deeply. And then we got no water. So we got to, I got to go and take water from a spot somewhere far away from home. And every day I got to take more than 10, 10, 10 times to collect water. And then we got no power, there's no electricity, you know because our family just can't afford it. So we use a kerosene lamp. You know kerosene lamp? Yes. Yeah, it's a lamp with kerosene and then uh, we just light it to use it at night. And the effect of using kerosene lamp was uh, the next morning, your nostril is all black. Yeah. yeah. So this was my, like my childhood life. Yes, yeah, study is quite hard because uh, um, I got so many siblings, you know. So when I finish my senior high school, my parents just can't afford it. So I can't go to uni. Uh, even when I was doing my junior high school, it means from three. After from three, my dad just told me that I can't afford your study anymore. So my, my form four and my form five was being supported by my teacher. I studied in the Catholic school, a missionary school. So my maths teacher, he was so kind to me. He uh, support me for the whole two years. When I finished my senior high school, I applied to become a police officer in Malaysia. So I, I like to be a police officer and uh, because I can help people. Yeah. But then uh, the income was so small in Malaysia at the time. As a police constable in Malaysia, we only earn 275 ringgit, equivalent to about $90 in Australia a month. A month. So you can, you, I, we can, I can survive. Then later on, I apply for a job from the newspaper, become a dolphin trainer's job. That one earn four times More bigger, than police <laughs> bigger than police and good fun. I'll talk about dolphin later. And then later on, uh, the, the Johor Safari Park I work with, close shop, you know, close by the bank, unable to survive. And uh, I do my own business. So because of that business, I use the business migration visa to migrate to Australia for my children's education. Uh, even as a business migrant, migrated to Australia, it's a foreign land, you know. We don't know anything, we don't know anyone here. It's hard, it's really hard. So I struggled for many years to adapt into Australia environment. And uh, I can see a lot of my constituents in my area, they are refugees. As a refugees for last 10 years, they face more uncertainty, more suffering. So I got a lot of feel on them because I experienced that. As a, as a business migrant, yet I still struggle. What about refugees? Uh, so when, when I struggle, till I got into the WA police force, and in the police force, every day I deal with public. And a lot of migrants, because of their ignorance about Australian law, they end up in trouble. Trouble in driving, trouble in family, trouble in many ways just because of they don't understand Australian law. So when I was a police officer, I initiated a project. I translate the law and order in a plain English to the community, to the Vietnamese community, Chinese community, the Punjabi community, Sikh community, uh, this Indian community, Cambodian community, Burmese community. I went to all these community to preach, to tell them, to guide them 
hey, this is the actual Australian law to let them understand and hey, tell them about what is this police duty. If you report to police, what will happen? How police work for you? And what is this law means? What is that law means? And how to protect yourself? Crime prevention is better than cure, you know? So I went everywhere to try to like a preacher, you know? In uniform, in police uniform. Why I did that? Because they are new. They need a lot of support. They need understanding. Hence, I use my professional police uniform to approach them, to let them understand, give them confidence. I don't want to go through the hard way. Uh, domestic violence is a big issue, huge one. And it shouldn't happen in the first place. Uh, I believe uh, husband and wife, before become husband and wife, they fall in love to each other. Why not everything do with love? If you need to score someone, score with love, you know? If you need to punish someone with love, but not with this one, or not with very harsh thing, you know? So I, I always feel bad if I attend, when I was a police officer, to attend to domestic violence. And I always ask the husband, do you love your, love your wife before you got married? And everyone say yes. We love each other before we got married. Then go back to the root. Find out where you all lost your love. This is my way of talking to public when I deal with domestic violence. So domestic violence could happen because of both parties not talking to each other uh, or both parties demand too much on each other. So a lot of migrants, when they migrated to here, when they migrated, they migrate with one aim. They want to settle in in Australia. But after some time, my husband faced a lot of stress because like my my, my, my friend, they, they are well-to-do from Malaysia. So when they migrated here, husband lost the job. Can't get a job. So at last, husband became a cleaner. But before that, in Malaysia, he was an engineer. Now he become a cleaner. His heart is broken, you know. So every day, he go and clean, clean, clean. And his wife is not happy because why are you not looking for engineer job? Why now you come back as a cleaner? So wife is demanding from her husband. Husband is so sad now, I'm not engineer, no? I'm a cleaner. So both parties not talking to each other. Yeah. And as a result, this thing become uh, harder you know, to dissolve and then they end up crashing. Yeah. And when I get to know it, I always ask them to go back, how you started. And then try to find a solution. Don't carry on like that because when domestic violence becomes serious, police involved, like when I involved as a police, we have to find out who started the whole aggression. And then I got to give a 72 hours police order. So I got to remove that person out from the family. 72 hours means three days. You got to live away from your wife or husband and they cannot contact them. If you come close, police catch you, you'll be in jail. So the problem become more and more, more and more serious. And then at last, the family break, break up. Kids will be suffering. So I think domestic violence issue need to start from community, need to start from family, need to educate, let everyone understand domestic violence is not good. So how to resolve it? We got to talk to each other more. The more we talk, the more we can find solution. And also, I think community leaders need to reach out to the community as well. Uh, the Punjabi group, the Indian group, the Chinese group, all the Asian people, they are very passive. They want face. They don't want people to know, I fight with my wife. Yeah. So community leaders should reach out in a, in a very subtle way yeah. and trying to let them understand that don't, don't encourage them to go for domestic violence. But if worst case scenario happened already, must get police to involve yes. so that there is no casualty. Bad things could happen and not good for the wife or the victim, not good for the children. So other than community, other than the police involvement, there is also, they have to self-realize. The husband or the wife should self-realize they shouldn't get involved in domestic. 
so they have to really uh, make an attempt make an attempt for their future yeah and i think a community also lost patience patient patient to each other uh, relationship i've been married to my wife 40 years it's not easy she got to tolerate it with me big time you know uh, and and, uh, and 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 we got to tolerate each other it is it's not easy but we 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 sort it out yeah, yeah. even teeth and tongue yeah. sometimes we bite you know we're so close to each other so close but teeth and tongue bite you know what about husband and wife yeah. two different human beings come together right. um, i migrated to australia in 2002 yeah. december um, I got a criteria for my business migration visa yep. to change to permanent residency visa. Yep. So I have to run a small business. Yep. I have to employ three workers. Yep. And I was shocked mm -hmm. because I got no idea how to run business in Australia. Yep. So what I did was uh, I went to Small Business Development Corporation in Perth mm -hmm. and I went and attend many courses mm -hmm. to understand. So as a new migrant, when you migrated to Australia yeah. or you want to do a small business in Australia, yeah. you must learn all the law, all the rules yeah. and what, what, what is uh, happening in the market. Yeah. So in WA, there is called Small Business Development Corporation, yeah. SBDC. So I went there, there, I learned all the necessary information. Mm -hmm. So when you are doing business, you understand the law and order, mm -hmm. you, you know how to go with it. Yeah. Uh, but then you also get to know what is a government policy yeah. because some government policy may help you mm -hmm. but you need to reach out to them yeah. if you don't reach out to them yeah. they got no idea yeah. so uh, I also reach out for help from yeah. the government and government provide help for us yeah. so if anyone that is unsure about where can they get help mm -hmm. they can go to their local member of parliament or they can go to the member of parliament uh, federal level because all member of parliament they got different different yeah. uh, different way different uh, uh, different what is it called different things that they can help yeah. small businesses yeah. so you got to learn you got to know where you can get help yeah. uh, when i about to buy a business yeah. you know in wa I went to the Small Business Development Corporation. Yep. That's exactly what they taught us. Yep. You must understand the market. Yep. You must have a lawyer, you must have an accountant and all that. Yep. But also from that department, I learned mm -hmm. how to negotiate a purchase price. Oh, yes. So that, yeah, that shop yeah. trying to sell me like 175,000. Yeah. So I took the whole thing yeah. and brought it back to the teacher that taught me. I said. I said, uh, I think his name was um, Bruno, yes. Okay. I said, Bruno, can you help me to have a read? So Bruno read, read and told me, Sam, 175000 too expensive. You offer him 50000 I said, what? 50000 <laughs> 175000 selling price. Yeah. He told me, yeah. go there, offer 50000 Yeah, a lot of difference, yeah. And what I, what I did was, I really offer 50000 Yeah. I cut off the 175, 50,000, yeah. give it back to the agent. Mm. And do you know how much I bought it for? Mm. 75,000. Yeah. So he was the market that the, sell, the agent was selling 175. Yeah. And my mental, mentality for Malaysia is yeah. there's no way we can bargain, right? Yeah. So I thought I, I got to buy 175,000 that mm. business, mm. but I got it for 75,000 yeah. because I went to the right source and trained by them and they helped me to get that so later on they introduced me a, 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 a accountant and the accountant introduced a lawyer for some, some advice and the lawyer told me the contract to sign five plus five is too long yeah. i said why in malaysia we can terminate the contract the lawyer said no 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 here five plus five means you are buying 10 years agreement. I don't know. So from there, I learned. I said, no, no, no. Well, I want to do it two plus two. Mm. Uh, I'm from an Asian background. From Asian background, we, we very respect 
to authority, with respect to elder, with respect to mom and dad, uncle, auntie. So we not so, I, I think Asian, we are not so harsh in, in voicing our opinion. We wouldn't dare to. But coming to Australia, I realized that if you don't voice out your opinion, people don't know. So you have to voice out. And I struggled many years to become a very vocal. And I'm still not very vocal. Something I see, sometimes I think many, many times before I open my mouth. I think this, this is our, our culture. We are not really that outspoken. But you still got to voice out your concern. So coming to Australia, to all, all migrants, all people from multicultural, you have to voice out. If, uh, if you don't voice out, you lose out. Yeah. So I can help you to voice out. Yeah. That's my job. Uh, so uh, if you got any issue that you're uncertain, unsure, uh, reach out to me. My name is Sam Lim. I'm here to help you to voice out. But also, uh, if you need to voice out something, don't voice out something very personal. Because if you voice out something, the issue, not the person then we can get things sorted. If we go for person, then it's very messy. Yeah. Yeah.